The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We call it living history because the whole point is to make it as real as we possibly can. Fire! I grew up just outside of Houston and I didn't know that there was a lot of nature and natural spaces out there. Here we go. Nice. He came back and nailed it. Yeah, he did. I watched the whole thing. And I'm not sure if he's a keeper, but it's a fish. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Right, Mark. Mark, man. Fire. At its height, Fort Richardson was the largest military post in the United States. Had uh, close to a thousand soldiers here. Fort Richardson was established in 1867. It was the northernmost of the frontier forts throughout now what is the state of Texas to help protect the western movement of the settlers coming out. The fort system was really integral in being able to settle the state. So without the fort system, we wouldn't have had a state of Texas. We wouldn't have been able to, you know, to defend it and be able to inhabit it as we do now. This weekend, we're hosting our annual Living History event. And today, we had 26 school buses roll in here. I'd have a pot in the fire, and I would pour a whole lot of bullets. That is cool. There are some people that get everything they need out of reading textbooks um, or in the classroom, but I am not one of those people. You got the basics down. We are giving visitors an opportunity to see what life was like back when this fort was operational. They get to see the soldiers in action and to see what activities might be available to the children who lived in the fort back in the day. It makes that connection to their history. Still there, isn't it? We're out here on a field trip, out here to learn about the 1800s and how they lived and stuff. They didn't have much technology that we have today, I mean, obviously, so they had to put in a little bit more work to do simple tasks. Oh. <laughs> Would you imagine having to do that every day? Yeah. Hard to get out stains. Company, forward, march! We got to march across the field with guns. Double quick time, march! It'd be pretty scary to know Stay that you're basically about to go fight. Company, charge! Because I don't want to get shot. Like doctors and stuff, like it's a bit harder for them to work. He took care of 50 day troops using them. The surgeons. It's just crazy how they got through it all with just a little bit of medicine. Fort Richardson has some incredible historic buildings here on site and there are tours available for people who are coming and want to learn a little bit more about it. We still have seven of the original historic buildings still standing, two reconstructed buildings, a museum, an interpretive center staff here at Fort Richardson take great pride in, in protecting and maintaining the integrity of, of these historic structures. Fort Richardson has a ton to offer. It not only has the historical aspect, the park has uh, 57 campsites. All of them have water and electricity. We do have limited use cabins, nature trails, we have the historic uh, Rumbling Springs here in Lost Creek. We also have a nine mile multi-use trail that wraps around both municipal lakes, comes out at what we call our North Park over there. We have uh, the historic side of it, lots of hiking, biking, and equestrian. We have a lot to offer here in Jacksboro. An hour from Fort Worth. 
You just twirl the thing back and forth. And when kids like come out here, they're stunned. When I was cooking this morning, uh, they were like, is that a real fire? Well, yes, indeed, it's a real fire. And yes, that's real smoke. And that's really hurting your eyes. Which work? Okay. They're kind of stunned because a lot of kids, they don't smell bacon cooking on a fire. They don't see horses. They don't see uh, gun smoke from a cannon. If history is real from the distance you are from me right now, then it's, it's believable. Having that multi-sensory experience just really helps connect people to that history and, and see why it's valuable and important to conserve that history. We were the closest defensive line to Oklahoma, which was Indian territory. Uh, we were a major contributor in the Red River War campaign. Fort Richardson was a training post for the World War II campaign. And the battalion that trained here became known as the Lost Battalion. Fort Richardson's really unique, and to keep it alive just as long as we possibly can, I think it's the best possible way to honor what's going on out here and all the diverse cultures that have come through here and helped build this place. I grew up just outside of Houston, and I didn't know that there was a lot of nature and natural spaces out there. Uh, but then I started noticing, and I started looking, and, and I just found it all over the place. I happened to live in the back of the subdivision next to a creek, and so I spent all my time exploring and being outside in the woods. And then I found out that you can actually make a living at being a wildlife biologist. So that's how I got started. A lot of folks uh, hear urban wildlife and they think grackles and raccoons, but our urban areas are full of natural spaces. They're full of creeks and rivers and green belts. And when you put all that together, it's, it's a matrix of urban wildlife habitat. So you need a good wide view of the trail. So as the animal comes in, it triggers the camera. Half a second later, the camera takes a picture and now it's right in front of the camera. People care about the places close to them. My team can go out and help create more of those spaces for people to enjoy. It's an exciting thing because then other people will get excited about it and then more people will be able to enjoy it. And the more people that enjoy it, the more they want to protect it. It's exciting to be able to come in and just and see the different kinds of representation that are out there that represent diversity in Texas Parks and Wildlife. People begin to get engaged and be able to give back that experience and bring more diversity into the wildlife field. What Richard has done for the diversity of our human capital at Texas Parks and Wildlife, especially within our conservation outreach program, is just hiring a, a diversity of staff. Maybe the next time I go talk to a group, there's going to be some young person in there who's, you know, in an underrepresented group who thinks, you know, I see, I could see myself being there and I could see myself doing this work. I think that's one of the things that's so exciting is about the opportunities for who we could be um, bringing to the table in conservation and wildlife work. This program necessarily is really important, especially with inner city kids. And the most important thing that Richard has done for us in this is just his unwavering support of what we need to do. He is right there for us. One summer I was doing a, a study and my cameras kept getting stolen. The only way I could fix that was to put it in poison ivy. And uh, suddenly my cameras weren't being stolen anymore. One of the things that I appreciate most about working with Richard um, and his leadership is that he's always been so incredibly supportive of his staff and the work that we're doing. One of the challenges of having a very diverse constituency is being able to uh, either have or understand the perspectives of all Texans. And one way we can do that is by training a diverse set of wildlife professionals. There's a difference between a boss and a leader. A boss is someone that tells you what to do and how to do it, and a leader is someone who shows you what to do. And that's Richard. We'll go and set it up right here. It's Friday night, and that means football, the ultimate high school sport here in Texas. Or is it? I felt it, and it got real heavy. Set the hook, and it popped. Colt Anderson and Jonathan Gray are at practice.
Donald. Oh. These two are part of a high school fishing team. When I first started out fishing, I mean, you start out with the Zebco, right? Everybody starts out with the Zebco or spinning reel. And then you start throwing these bait casters, which will really help me out next year in tournaments. Oh. Got one. <laughs> they are fine tuning their skills for the upcoming season. Oh boy. You don't have to be the biggest kid or the tallest kid or the most athletic kid to be a bass fisherman. It's all about your knowledge. Oh gosh, did you see that? You came at it at a million miles an hour. I don't know, it's kind of like playing golf a little bit where you have different tools and you have to adapt to the conditions. A uh, little guy, but he's a fish. You can never become perfect at fishing. A good one. And so that's kind of a cool thing. You can always improve. Yeah, it's a pretty healthy fish. He's been sitting in this hydrilla for a while, so a uh, nice little fish. This tournament, we expect in excess of 80 teams participating. It's March on Lake LBJ, and it's time for the state high school fishing championship. Both high school and collegiate bass fishing have exploded in about the last five years. There's competition, there's scholarships associated with it. Thank you. But more than anything, I think it's bragging rights. Colt and Jonathan are considered two of the favorites. We want to target the larger fish, because this tournament on this lake, typically it takes larger fish to win. Yes, ma'am, we should. Traveling five hours from Carthage, Texas, are Marina Collins and Mia Sarder. Thank you. They are the only female team in the tournament. It is very intimidating. It's hard being the only girl, uh, only girl team out there. But uh, we, we're cool. We got this. I don't know. I'm just, I've never done this before either. It's my first too. So we're gonna represent. Yeah. <laughs> um, we started talking strategy, but that's confidential. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> it's tournament time. Colt and Jonathan head for some of the lake's boat docks and slips. Marina and Mia check out a quiet bank on the south side of the lake. I think it's going to be a good spot because of how shallow it is, because I think they're getting in the shallows to start making the reds for spawning. This is my first year, so I am a little scared. I mean, you just gotta relax and chill. Let's go with it. <laughs> for Marina, her hero is always a step away. I had to have him. I've had him for a long time. Wonder Woman, uh, she's powerful. I mean, she can stand up on her own. She knows how to handle stuff. <laughs> While it's tough going for this dynamic duo. Oh, that is a keeper. Oh, this looks so good. By the boat docks and slips, Colt and Jonathan see all kinds of action. You see him? He's no. right there. He's right there in front of the boat. Is it a good one? That's a three pounder. Three? Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a three pounder. Three or four. Oh, there we go. Ah, oh, man, he's a keeper. Gosh, dang it. Those keeper bass are sitting on spawning beds. It's lighter than everything else where the bass has cleared out all the silts and all the little sand and they've left the rocks there so that it can hold their eggs. Here we go. Nice. He came back and nailed it. Yeah, he did. I watched the whole thing. And I'm not sure if he's a keeper, but it's a fish. Yeah, he's too short. That was sweet. I think the keys to winning the tournament is finding where the fish are and what they're going after. Unfortunately, the fish here never seem to be too interested, and that's okay. I like to do it because I can get out of the house, have fun, and you learn something new every day. Ooh, I think that's the furthest I've cast yet. <laughs> that felt good. <laughs> it's really cool being in this club because you get to meet a lot of different people, and we're all of one big family. And that's really good to have friends that you can be really close with. Throughout the afternoon, the boys can see some fish. Oh, there's another one, there's another one. There is. But can't seem to get them to bite. Ooh, man. He likes. Oh, oh he's gonna bite. He got. Oh, oh, man. Gosh, dang it. The adrenaline. I love the adrenaline. Any cast you make can be a big one. 
That's what I like about it. Boom. Got one. Oh, it's a good one. Five pounder. Please stay on, please stay on, please stay on. Yeah. What is that? You ready to get him? Yep, I'm ready. Please give him the net. Please give him the net. That's bigger than five. That's bigger than five. That's a six. It's a giant. As the tournament wraps up, for Marina and Mia, <laughs> there are no fish, but there are plenty of smiles. Uh, today really didn't go as well as I thought it would, but uh, yeah, we had, had fun. fun. I mean, almost falling off the boat a couple times, but we still had fun. Is that good? Whoa. That one, that we one. need to get him over to the air it's quick. Yeah. Other anglers have some serious games. Oh yeah, some big fish caught today. All right, coming up next we have Colt Anderson and Jonathan Grace. For Colt and Jonathan, both know they didn't catch enough to win. It was a rough day, rough day on the water. Six pounds, 10 ounces. We we're expecting to do a little better today. It looks like they got a monster in there. Three fish, 14 pounds. Moves you guys into second place. 23 pounds, 11 ounces, 32 pounds even, your new leader. 32 pounds for the win, Oh, which I'm sure will stand. I don't think anybody gets <laughs> that. Well, we thank you guys for coming out. Glad you guys enjoyed your time out in the water. Yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back. Yeah, Stronger than last time. Definitely. <laughs> Probably see some shad sitting up here. So in between tournaments, it's back to Lake Pflugerville for some more practice. This is uh, probably the lake I get the fish most. I'm just sucked it down. Just because it's so close to where I live, this is where I've caught my biggest fish, and this is where uh, this is where I really enjoy fishing. It's always good to keep fishing, just so just so you keep your, your mind straight. And as far as this fishing team sport idea, it seems to be catching on. Me personally, it was just another way to be competitive. Oh gosh, let's get up here. He's a little guy. And a cool thing about us, we like open up our, our minds and find new friends. Got him? Oh my oh, God. God. <laughs> and you don't, you don't have to be Seven foot tall and bench 280. Bench 280 to <laughs> to fish. I mean, look, Colt. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm that, just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good. Squeeze again. So I taught PE and, and uh, biology and health. Now you know how hard it is for the spider to make her web, don't you? And I decided I didn't want to be inside any longer. I like being outside. And I think this is the perfect fit for me. I'm hoping that the kids have as much fun as I have. The spider in the web. It's not what we know, it's how we think about nature. The spider in the web. Project Wild provides the curriculum for that. Growing Up Wild provides the curriculum for that. I use it almost every day. Project Wild is professional development for educators to help them teach about wildlife and wildlife issues. On any given Saturday, somebody in Texas is probably getting trained in Project Wild. I'm trying to wake you up. Heads up. Where's your thumb? Water. Yay! And there are hundreds of facilitators who are certified to conduct those trainings pretty much anywhere. Is there more water than land? Yes. In the workshop, they get a book and the teachers learn how to teach the children. What you're gonna do is teach this to the rest of us and have us participate like we're the students. I've done every single one of these with the kids in this book. The Project Wild activities are experience-based. 
regardless of the level of your students. Everyone in the class will have shared the same experience with the content, and then the teacher has something to work from. When you attend a Texas Parks and Wildlife Project Wild workshop, you receive it from a facilitator who is local to your area and resources that are pertinent for that area. The really tiny things that you end up finding the most interest and the most detail. You get real lucky you might hit a snake. They know what the issues in their area are and they're gonna make the workshop most relevant for their audience at their site. Our old friend uh, Mountain Seer, it's the male that puffs out that yellow pollen um, that's giving you those aller allergy problems. This program helps people overcome oh, some maybe preconceived notions uh, of icky tree, bugs reaction. and things like that. Check it out, watch. Oh, ew. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that red is used as a dye still to this day. There's a lot of visual activity, so this appeals to so many different children and the way that they learn. Having lessons that are using the outdoors to teach, um, it can't be beat. The goal or the struggle or the challenge as a prey is to get over to the end, grab some food and get back to shelter and not get eaten by the predator. We're playing about a five minute round. She should only take one token of food at a time. The thing that makes Project Wild Workshops different is that you actually do the activities as if you were a kid. They demonstrate with the participants how to do the activities. 30 seconds. And discuss from a teacher's perspective how you would use them and what the advantages and disadvantages of some of the strategies are and that sort of thing. <laughs> so this Project Wild Training today was designed to educate educators. This all-day shop gave them some ideas and some tools to pass these nature-based messages on to their students. Class, class, class. Thank you for getting quiet. We are going to be talking about and doing a game about predators and prey. In the thicket is a great lesson to teach predator-prey relationship. Raise your hand and remind me, what is a predator? As well as how animals adapt to their surroundings to deal with predator-prey situations. And that's fun because it's very active. And they get to be the predator and prey and they get to experience it. Come here, predator. I'm going to take her all the way over here. She is going to turn around and she's going to look for all her prey. If she sees you and she calls your name, you have to come with her. You're going to be a predator too. They will hide in our garden space, but still have to have their eye on the predator. And go, one, two, three. And we'll discuss why you want your eye on the predator. Just so they can say, how close can you get to the predator without being noticed? Because you've adapted to the environment. 18, 19, 20. Now, who can you see? Call out their names. Mommy, I saw you, Donna. Usually, I have one idea I want them to take away from it. You know, big idea. But the other thing I want them to understand for it is learning doesn't happen in the classroom. Learning happens everywhere. Every space they're in, every experience they're having is a learning experience. Max, I saw you. <laughs> Come on up, Max. And then we'll deconstruct it and figure out what worked and get their opinions. What was the easiest thing for you to spot somebody? I mean, what we want to do is help children grow up into adults who can think about the wildlife and their habitats. It would be nice if some of them grew up to be wildlife biologists, but really we would just like everyday people to just kind of get it.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.